Hey guys, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. This is Tyler, co-hosting. We've got a special episode for you. Today, we've got the man himself, the founder, the owner of Blue Planet on the Blue Planet Show. Really excited to have you, Rob. Uh, welcome to the show, or welcome back, as we should say. Okay. Uh, today, we're going to ask him a few questions about his ownership, his entrepreneurship, and his new book, Stand Up Paddleboard for Dummies. So stay tuned. we got a lot of great information coming for you. Uh, my name's Tyler. This is Rob. Rob. 30 plus years, my man, in the paddleboard industry, and you just finished your first book, The Stand-Up Paddleboard for Dummies. How does it feel? Yeah, it feels great. Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for, you know, Tyler had this idea to put me on the interview seat. Usually I'm the one interviewing people in the, in the industry, so thanks for, <laughs> thanks for uh, that idea. You bet. But yeah, um, you know, it's been a pretty crazy year for me, pretty busy. Um, Right, like yeah, I was asked to write a book um, about stand-up paddleboarding you know, by Wiley Publishing mm. Company. Um, they do the Four Dummies series, so they, you know, they they asked me, like, sent me an email, do you, you know, if if I'd be open to writing a book about stand-up paddling, and it's kind of, you know, it's always been one of my things, um, like early on in the stand-up paddle world when it first got started, like I had a couple mentors that said, you know, brand yourself as the stand-up paddle expert. You know, you, you're into it, you're an athlete, you're, you're selling it, you're, you know probably more than most people about it. So that's kind of <clears throat> was my goal, you know, to, to brand myself as the expert. So I started blogging and then <clears throat> I realized, uh, you know, my friend Evan Long, who had that... Um, a podcast or like you know he uh, YouTube channel, stand up paddlesurf.net. He came into the shop and's like, oh, you know that post you made, that's cool stuff. Can we make a video about it? You know, so he recorded a, a video on his brand new iPhone. It's like the first um, iPhone one, you know, back then. <laughs> He's like, oh, that's a cool looking phone. You know, you can film with that. You know, it's like it's a, anyway. So he just recorded this quick video, posted it on YouTube, and you know my my written blog post got like. A few hundred views and that video got like thousands of views and i was like oh this is this is it i guess got to make videos it's way easier too i found you know like just talking about something and showing it rather than writing about it and trying to show what you're doing in pictures and so yeah then that started the blue planet youtube channel and then um yeah and then that kind of led to having the video that i think we shot it together to um mm. stand up how to stand a paddleboard in five minutes yeah and now that's had it's about two point five million. Yeah, like two and a half million views. Um, so that's probably the most popular video on, on YouTube for stand up paddling. Um, people get getting into it. So, and I think that's why they contacted me. It's like, oh, you know, this guy hmm. must know what he's talking about. So, so and I was kind of right my up my alley. So when they sent me an email, I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds like something I should do. You know, to brand myself as the expert. So um, I said yes, and then. I realized uh, kind of what I was getting into and, yeah. you know, like writing is really hard for me. It was so challenging. Um, you know, in retrospect, it's like, you know, don't whine about it, but, mm. <laughs> but just like sitting yourself down and when you have a business to run and doing other fun stuff yeah. uh, in the afternoon, trying to go wing foiling or, or stand up paddling and then having to, you know, dedicate time to it. Mm. And, and I also found that I can't just like work on it for an hour like it takes me almost an hour to really get into it. So then I just um, started doing like one day a week where I just would focus on writing for like five, six hours and right on. try to make write a chapter every every week. And finally got the manuscript finished. Now it's like through in the editing process and then it's going to be ready uh, in stores probably in early next year. So pretty excited about that. It's like I'm super stoked to have it finished. You know? yeah. yeah. I had the unique opportunity to read the book. Uh, before it was released right you're the um, technical editor right so you get to check and make sure my facts are straight and that's stuff right like that. yeah. mm -hmm. which was super fun lots of great information great storytelling so from a reader's perspective very entertaining had enjoyed reading it so you know as those may probably strenuous sitting down writing all i think it's like 25 chapters uh over the scope of pretty much everything in the paddleboard industry uh i think your readers are going to be pretty excited once it gets out on the market when is it going to be released? Um, I'm I'm not sure the exact date, but I, I believe. Um, I mean, you can already pre-order pre it on Amazon and um, Barnes and Nobles and so on. Different websites have it available. It's called Stand Up Paddleboarding for Dummies. If you just search it, it'll give you um, different options. It's supposed to be about 250 pages. 
Nice. And it's going to have lots of illustrations to it and images. And, but yeah, it's, Very cool. um, yeah. Another it's huge feat for you this year. It's been a big year for you, Rob. The M to O, you've entered the M to O, I think you said 13 times. And this was the first year that you did it in two different divisions. Not only that, you also won your most competitive division over the years, the uh, stock division, paddleboard open stock. How does it feel to take first place and to also do it in foiling? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was amazing that, I mean, you know, for, that was the first year that they separated the foil race and the stand-up paddleboard race. Um, and I kind of actually was like, oh, this, I think it's a great idea. And then maybe a lot of people are going to do both races, you know, um, you know, the foiling. Because a lot of the good stand-up paddlers got into foiling. And then now that's kind of all they do. But I thought maybe some of them would do the um, stand-up paddle race as mm -hmm. well, you know, because they're only a week apart and stuff like that. But it turns out I was actually the only one, I think, who did both races in solo divisions. Um, there's another um, competitor that did it in, as a team race in the prone, the, uh, prone paddleboard and stand-up foiling. But, um, yeah, there's only really two of us who did both weekends in a row. Um, but, yeah, it was super cool. You know, I did, did well. I was in the top ten, I think, in the foil, wing foil race. So I was pretty stoked about that result. And then... Uh, yeah, and then I wasn't expecting you know, really anything. I was training with my friend Roland Graham uh, a lot, and, and you know other other paddlers as well. But Roland kind of consistently was always faster than me in training, you know. Mm. And I hadn't really been, you know, since I haven't done it since 2019. Really, I haven't been training uh, actively mm. for downwind racing. But you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You know, I got back into it, so it was kind of more of a matter of getting back in shape for it. And I was always chasing after Roland. So my goal was just, I just want to be able to be as fast as Roland or get, get in ahead of Roland if I can, you know. So, mm. And then we had like, really, I think the only day I was actually a little bit faster than him was when we did our longest training run. And he was just had a little bit of an off day. And I was just like, oh, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe I can go be faster than Roland, you know. And um, so, you know, that was the only time I was, um, came in ahead of him, which was like a few weeks before the race. And then the day of, you know, I was just like, okay, I just like, um, I, had an in, I had an interview too with um, Dave Kalama and I asked him, like, can you give me some pointers? So he gave me some pointers and I, that was kind of in my head during the race too, like, you know, breathing, you know, stay even keel, don't get too excited, don't get frustrated, you know, like just, um, and then I kind of just told myself, okay, don't, don't get too excited right now. I know just conserve your energy. This one guy, um, I think from Brazil, he passed me, but he was on an unlimited board. And for a long time, we were like neck and neck, and I was kind of trying to keep up with him. But, you know, he had like a longer unlimited board, so his board speed was a little bit better. And and it was just like kind of wearing me down to try to keep up with him. So I was just like, okay, just let him go. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm doing my own thing, you know. So, um, and then, yeah, at the end, I, I didn't really know. I was, um, I mean, I kind of knew that I was in, in the front, but... I ended up finishing third overall, and there's only uh, two other unlimited boards in front of me, and so that was super exciting. I mean, that would never happen. To, you know, like you said, 13 races. Um, I mean, I came in a few. I, I've won my age group before. I've gotten like second place in my age group a mm -hmm. bunch of times, but to win it overall, is, I've never even come close to that. So that was yeah, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's also the reason is because it's just not as competitive anymore. You know, there's not as many top pros um paddling it you know true i mean if you like kai lenny or connor baxter <laughs> there's like a a lot of um really good paddlers that could have easily beat me in that race mm. um, but they just weren't entered in that division so yeah it's like they say 80 percent of success is showing up that's right <laughs> still a great feat congratulations thank you when you compare that to the foil race which was you know a week prior yes or was it the other way around yeah it was one week before yeah that must have been very competitive record times how did that feel being in like a pioneering sport from maui to oahu yeah i mean that that race was super fun and exciting and, and the cool thing about the foiling race too is that it was like kind of a whole um really two weeks of racing there was mm -hmm. a paddle moor race like um the prior weekend on maui so we two went there, 
No, that was um, on. That's on Maui. It's a Maliko run. Oh, okay. The the and they had like a triple crown. They called it. So the, that was the first race of the triple crown. Was the um, Padre Mua race, and then the following weekend was the Maui to Molokai on mm -hmm. a Friday. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had the race from Maui to Molokai, and it was a huge uh, stand-up foil division, and also a really big wing foil division. And I think I finished like top five, I think fourth place overall. So that was kind of a surprise because there's some super fast guys and mm. um, a couple of them just uh, came off foil at the very end and I was able to pass them. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so that was that was really cool. Um, and then the following day they had the um, Molokai Holokai race, which is along the coast on Molokai, one of the best downwind runs mm. in the world, I would say. And, and that was just, so just a super fun race on the Saturday. And then the Sunday, they had the Molokai to Oahu race. So kind of three days of racing, hanging out with my friends. Eli has this condo um, over there, Kalua Koi. And uh, yeah, so super that was fun. just a super fun weekend, you know, like mm -hmm. um, good camaraderie. And, and, the, and then the race on Sunday was, yeah, very competitive, big, big field. Good win at the beginning. Then the wind got really light. So it was a pretty challenging mm -hmm. um, race. But, you know, the, the finish time of the wing foil race was a little bit over two hours, I think. Yeah, a little bit over two hours. And the Santa wow. Pal race was almost six hours. Wow. <laughs> so we're talking about almost three times as long to do the same distance. So mm. like we're doing in the Santa Pal board, I'm doing about a third of the speed as on a wing foil. Right. right. So, and so obviously it's much more physically demanding. Mm. And that's kind of one of the, the reasons why I wanted to do it again, because I realized that it's what gets me, really gets me in shape. The year, mm. last year, I didn't train for stand-up paddling, and, um, you know, I was in pretty good shape from wing foiling, but it's just a different thing if you have to do something for six hours at yeah. a much higher um, heart rate and, and intensity, you know. And um, so just that training for the stand-up paddling, um, mm. I think was really good for me uh, physically and mentally, like, you know, endurance and the perseverance and all that kind of stuff. So nice. I love it. I mean, my wife was like, you should retire what, you know, you want it. So <laughs> I just retire from it. I was like, oh, I don't know. I think it's going to keep doing it. It's, it's, it's good for me, I think. So I'd like to take you back before Blue Planet, before the brand to your original water sport, which was windsurfing. And your days on Maui and living in a van, touring Maui and enjoying the sport of windsurfing. What was that like, you know, and as the sport was really in its peak? Oh, uh, you know, that's a long story. I don't even know where to start. But, yeah, I mean, my dream in school was to um, to go to Maui or, you know, to windsurf in Hawaii, really. Um, and I learned how to windsurf when I was, like, 15 years old or something like that. And we, you know, living in Germany, Berlin. Um and, you know, I was trying to get to the lakes or um, to the ocean in Denmark and different places, uh, Italy, Spain, windsurfing. Um, and then, you know, just getting the magazines and seeing people, you know, windsurfing in Hawaii in shorts uh, all year round and big waves and, you know, turquoise water. And dream. that was my dream, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I s saved up some money, worked construction for a while and then ended up in Maui. And, you know, I wasn't 21 yet, so I couldn't rent a car and I had to rent a moped um, to get around. And then, um, yeah, and I just wanted to stretch my money as, as far as it would go. So and I had some money saved up, but um, most of it was in a cashier's check. And I went to Bank of Hawaii and they wouldn't cash it. You know, they're like, oh, we have to put a 30 day hold on it, you know, so. And, and, but like the first thing I bought was like a used car for like 400 bucks or something, old VW. Nice. And, um, and that was most of the cash I had on me. So then I had to get, get an address. Like, so the guy that sold me the car said, oh yeah, you can use my address for your bank account. So, mm. um, and then I had to wait 30 days for the money. So then I had to get a job and, and I, yeah, I was living at, um, on the beach, you know, living out of my car for, <laughs> for quite a while. That was but that was great. I got to meet a lot of people, just, you know, all the, got my windsurfing stuff and um, just try to just windsurf as much as I could and enjoy life. And, and then started working as a dishwasher at Dylan's restaurant in Paia. Hard to imagine. <laughs> I had to get up super yeah. early in the morning, wash dishes. <laughs> but then I was awesome. like done after breakfast service and then I could spend the rest of the day just having fun. So yeah, yeah that, those are actually good days. I mean, it sounds... Um, 
I mean, I did realize that I, I didn't want to live with like no money in mm. the bank and having, yeah. <laughs> and having to struggle every day. But sure. Um, but other than that, I, I would say, I mean, you know, I was just living the dream, you know? Mm. Yeah. So windsurfing, passion, Hawaii, and then college, right? So you make the move over to Oahu. When did you get accepted to UH Manoa and, and the business program? Well, I mean, that's kind of a long story, too, because then after one year on Maui, living in Maui, just having fun, I, I was kind of, OK, now it's time to get serious. So mm. I'm going to go back to Germany and st start studying, going to university. You know, right on. that's kind of what my parents were expecting from me, too. And um, and then I also had the, like I love snowboarding, too. And I had this opportunity. I met a guy on Maui that had like started a snowboard company and. As soon as I got back wow. to Germany, he was like, called me. He's like, hey, come to Switzerland. I got a place for you. We'll pay you to just snowboard all the time and do demos and whatever, you know? So it's like, and like looking back at it, it's like, oh, I should have just done that instead yeah. of like, I, I basically wasted a semester in Berlin because I hated it after, you know, I just started college mm. in Berlin University mm. and I, I hated it. And I was like, I just want to go back to Maui. So, mm. Mm. Um, so that's what I did after, um, you know, being in, in Berlin for half a year. Then I ended up, Doing working construction again to save up some money. I have my um, my cousin's husband's company was building a house in Hood River, Oregon. So I spent the summer there building a house and windsurfing every day in Hood River. Cool. And then um, and then went back to Maui and started at Maui Community College studying just liberal arts and business. Mm -hmm. And then after two years there, then I transferred to UH Manoa. Yep. And I did the you know business pro international business program at UH Manoa. And, and that's where, you know, I started Blue Planet. Basically, it was a marketing class and I had, uh, you know, um, I had to write a marketing plan and then I had to write a business plan. And I just did that as, you know, Blue Planet. And one of it was, it was like a group project too. So I had other students helping me write this business plan. And, you know, it was like, oh yeah, it's going to be like Quicksilver. We're going to grow it to like hundred million dollars in 10 years or, whatever, <laughs> or something like that, you know? And it's still great on paper, but um, so I was like, ah, you know, you know, what do I, what do I have to lose? You know, I mm. didn't really have that much, but so I'm just gonna, just gonna go for it and try mm. it, you know. And then when I graduated, you know, I actually applied for some jobs, and I was like, um, Bank of Hawaii offered me like a position to train, be a management trainee kind of thing, mm. but it was like a nine to five job working in an office in a mm. bank, you know. I was like. No, I want to have time to windsurf and make my own schedule and stuff like that. So I thought, you know, like the idea was, you know, I want to be able to, you know, make my own schedule and have mm. fun when the wind is good and whatever. And I thought having your own business, I have the freedom and time to do that. But then it turned out to be like I ended up working a lot harder than I thought I would. And, and you know, um, but a lot of times I just have to remind myself like, the, the reason I started this business so mm. I can enjoy these sports that... You know, so so it's a good remi good reminder to um, yeah keep in mind to enjoy enjoy and have fun too. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So in the process of making the brand, you met a good friend who helped you create the infamous Blue Planet logo, which has really helped carry the brand uh, super far. Can you tell me a little bit about Fabrice and how you met and what it was that you guys were talking about when you made that logo? Yeah, it's actually the um, Brian Kim is the creator of the Chromag Fish logo. Excuse me. The, the, um, but Fabrice uh, was a really good friend, still is a really good friend. And um, he basically, I met him in Maui when I started at Maui Community College at the dorms. Uh, just moved into the dorms and he, Fabrice showed up and he was like a couple of years younger than me. I think he was only like 17 or 18 when he came to Maui. Mm. And he had kind of the same dream. He loved to windsurf and just wanted to windsurf and nice. be a pro windsurfer. And, and uh, yeah, he was really talented, but had like really crappy old gear and stuff like that. So, um, and didn't know anything. And it's like kind of like I took him under my wings a little bit and showed him the ropes a little bit. And then we just became really good friends. And um, then he also did the liberal arts degree and, and on Maui and then moved to Oahu to do uh, go to UH Manoa and do like a I think um, tourism degree and then you know as a student I started the Blue Planet business already hmm. and um, you know I got some I had some contacts I made some contacts in Japan through um, student friends and they started ordering t-shirts and then 
add like um, all these overruns. You know, I always had to order like six dozen or 12 dozen t-shirts or whatever. And then I um, always had too many um, t-shirts. And then so the boxes were piling up. I had a one bedroom apartment in Waikiki and the whole wall was like full of boxes. Oh. And I go, got to start selling more of these. I tried to get wholesale customers and had a few people that were bu um, buying it from us, but just not enough. So mm -hmm. I started, um, I got a booth at the swap meet or mm. I didn't actually didn't have a booth so to get a good location in the D row which is the outside row at the swap meet I had to go like at four in the morning wait in line like sleep in the van wow. wait, wait in line to get a good spot <laughs> and, and then set up at eight and at first I was just doing it by myself but then you know it started going pretty well mm. and um and I just needed help so I asked for Brees you know and it's like oh yeah yeah I'll come out with you you know so he, he started basically he was my first employee you know, other, other than Amy, my wife at the time. Hmm. Um, and yeah, and then he was just super helpful and always super encouraging. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so he, he really helped build the, the brand and the, the whole um, idea behind Blue Planet. And then uh, Brian Kim was also a friend from UH and my ex-wife's good friend from Iolani, hmm. Brian Kim. Um, he started doodling a bunch of designs and stuff like that and he had this thing um like a triangle shape maybe we can post it in the video too but sure. it, it's uh it was kind of this crazy design with bones and stuff like that but then he had this fish um and it had like the um, t-rex head like i guess he had that got the idea from jurassic park, jurassic park you know the nice. jurassic park logo and then he had put a fishbone body on it Cool. And I was like, uh, you know, this design, I don't really get it, but I like this fish. You know, yeah. can, can, can we just put the fish on a t shirt? And I nice. like, yeah, sure. You know, so I kind of sketched it out. And, and then. Um, Were the Hawaiian Islands already in there? No. no. that So that later. came later. Yeah. So, and I actually have a little video about that whole process too. Nice. But um, uh, yeah. So then that became our best selling t shirt design mm. at the Swap Meet. Mm. You know? And yeah. then everyone's like, oh, you guys have that cool fish logo, right? Yep. So, and it's like, um, at the time, we were using like this globe, a planet with a gear on it, you know, mm -hmm. blue planet surf gear. And, um, but people remember the fish. So I was like, yeah. okay, let's make the fish our main logo. Nice. And then uh, a b bunch of years later, my steps on Joe Giletti, who is a, you know, he's a, a graphic artist. Mm. And uh, he was like, oh, why don't you make these bones into the Hawaiian Islands, you know? So, and then, uh, uh, you know, he, he sketched it out and was like, oh, this is cool. You know, yeah, we got to we gotta incorporate that into the yeah. logo. So we basically changed the logo to have the Hawaiian Islands in the bone, in the fishbone cool. logo. And then we did the Rasta colors because that was kind of trendy at the time. But, mm. you know, still just add some, makes it stand out more. You know, mm. if it's just one color, you don't really notice the islands. But by making them a different color, it stands out more. So the passion was windsurfing and the t-shirts started with the fish logo. At what point did you say, okay, paddleboarding is where I want to take this and invest into my business and grow with paddleboarding? What was happening there? Uh, that came a little bit later, you know. Um, so, yeah, so at first it was mostly clothing, right? right. And the swap meet and we, we made shorts that were made in Hawaii and, um, and you know, at my... You know, Fabrice, my good friend Fabrice, we always, like, after the swap meet, would go to Sandy Beach and go body surfing or mm. go surfing or windsurfing, whatever was good, you know. the I started selling more and more boards. At, we had a shop on Kapuhulu Avenue. Mm. And we called it the surf store with sand on the floor. We had, like, sand on the floor, so it's kind of a unique surf shop. And we were selling a lot of used boards. Mm. And then I was like, oh, you know, make more money on new boards, you know, so... I got um, this contact. Well, at first we were selling some surf tech boards, that, like the kind of the epoxy boards were first coming out. And in windsurfing, epoxy was used for a long time, you know, and it's just much stronger. You know, they, uh, you know, basically in windsurfing, they made the switch from polyester to epoxy back in the 80s, you know, and just because it's stronger, lighter, more durable, longer lasting and all that kind of stuff, you know, so... Uh, surfing, it was just starting to like surf, surf tech introduce some, um, you know, sandwich epoxy boards. But, you know, I try to get them and it's like, oh, we can offer you like these two shapers that nobody else is selling, you know, mm -hmm. because, but they're like the least popular models I had kind of thing, you know, it's like, and they're very expensive boards and the margins weren't that great. So um, then I found this co company called Acme Supply 
um, that was making boards in, in the Czech Republic, you know, mm. but they were making good quality boards and they were also making windsurfing boards and they just started making surfboards. So, and they were making some boards for like, I think Steve Walden was already making boards mm. with them, you know, and then they rebranded as Boardworks, you know, they got a new owner and then, um, then it started really taking off and they got a lot of good shapers. And then we were kind of the exclusive distributor for, in Hawaii for, for Boardworks. And we were selling like containers and containers of that, their stuff and Walden Magic models. And then, then IPA got on board and um, it was growing really fast. Like we're, that's when we had some record sales too, but the margins were kind of small. Like I was, you know, turning over all these boards, but we're not really making enough margin to cover all our costs. So even though we're, our sales were growing, I was like, uh, where's this going? I'm not making any money, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not making money. And then, um, and then C4 Waterman came out with some of the very first stand-up paddle boards. Mm. Uh, Dave Parmenter was shaping them and Todd Bradley and Brian Kailana, they were um, starting with stand-up paddling, um, started this brand C4 Waterman to promote the sport and make their own products. And Boardworks was their manufacturer, so when they you know, were first available or ordered the container of stand-up paddle boards, and we were kind of the first ones in Hawaii to have production boards, you know, stand-up paddle boards. That's incredible. <laughs> I mean, around the same time, there was some other brands too, like Paddle Surf Hawaii and a couple others that you know, were just starting to have their own products. Before that, it was all stand-up paddling was just custom, you know. Mm. You had to order a custom board or order one of the surf techs that was like a really big long board, like mm. a 12-foot long board that was like 28 inches wide, wow. like 12 inches long, you know, kind of like our 12 footer, yeah. you know, but so it's tippy, even though it's super long and big, but not great for stand up paddling, but it works, you know, people can stand on it and that's what they were getting. But mm. then that was the first time like, stand up paddle boards were available. And then, so as soon as our first container arrived, because I hadn't really tried it before that, I didn't have a board I could use and so on. You know, I, um, you know, as soon as we had the container, I was like, okay, I'm selling this stuff. So I, better figure out how it works, you know, so I can talk about it. And then, you know, I kind of fell in love with it. Yeah. Um, first is surfing. That was, you know, I, like kind of like a lot of people, I just went straight into the surf and tried mm -hmm. to surf it. And it's like, you realize, oh, this is not as easy as it looks, you know, like just balancing on it and catching a wave and, you know, you're paddling on one yeah. side and turning out of the wave. And it's like, oh, how do you I remember yeah, my yeah. first beat down. And it's like, yeah. yeah. And then you're just like, okay, I'm just going to put the paddle underneath me and paddle into the wave yeah. and then stand up and pretend like I'm stand up paddling. Yeah. But anyways, so, you know, but and then I realized after a while, you know, that on a day when it was kind of crowded, small surf. It's like, ah, I'm just going to paddle over there, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to paddle from, you know, Aina Haina to Portlock, you know. Cool. So I started this like paddling and I was like, oh, this is kind of fun, you know, just like mm. paddling, catching a few waves along the way and just touring, you know. And uh, so I realized like, you don't really have to necessarily catch waves to have fun on the center of paddleboard. It's kind of yeah. like going on, a, going on a hike or something like that, you know, like touring around and. Uh, so yeah, and then that kind of stand up paddling became like my main thing, even, mm. like probably even more than windsurfing. Nice. But, or, you know, mostly on the days when, it, when the wind was light, then right. I would go stand up paddling. But then yeah. I got into downwinding, you know, I got some, got into downwind racing and then, mm. you know, that was super hard at first too. And then, but I got some really good tips from some of the top riders, you know, yeah. go, going out with really good paddlers like Aaron Napoleon and. You know, Dave Parmenter and but you know, Jeff Chang, my my good yeah. friend. And he, um, Jeff Chang did the Molokai race, and then I was like, ah, I want to do it next year too. So can I train with you? You know, so you then I started training with those guys, and um, yeah, and so that was uh, when was that? Uh, like around two thousand nine, I think mm -hmm. was my first Molokai race, and then really enjoyed the downwind racing. And started mm -hmm. doing going all over the world to to join in races. So boardworks, yeah. So that the whole thing basically said, if you can't pay me within so many days, then um, you're not a distributor anymore. We're going to do it ourselves. You know, mm. we're just going to distribute directly to people in Hawaii. You know, and I had all these accounts set up and contacts with all the retailers and everything like that. So um, he thought he could just like take it over and do it himself and not have to, you know, and mm. take me out of the loop. You know. Mm. And so that was kind of like, oh my God, you know, like how am I, what am I going to do now? You know, so I don't have boards anymore. And, um, it was like kind of, yeah, a critical point of the company. I actually considered just shutting down, like, you know, wow. just, like I was just going to get out of business and, mm. um, and, you know, I had all this overhead, I had employees to pay, rent yeah. to pay. 
and um, you know just the clothing at that point the clo clothing was kind of not my main focus anymore I was focused more on the hard goods and then uh, not having a supplier um, you know it was always like an exclusive agreement and it was like as long as, long as I was an exclusive distributor I couldn't um, distribute for other brands too you know so mm -hmm. I didn't really have a lot of other options to, for things to sell so um, but you know I got some good advice from mentors and, and friends in, in business they were like you know you have a great logo you know more th about the sport than most people you know what customers want you know you right. have the direct line to the consumers and and uh, why don't you just make your own boards you know mm. so um, and so I learned how to use like um, the Aku Shaper software at the time to help coaching on how to use the software. And, and um, you know, my first shapes were okay, mm. kind of crude, but yeah. I got some samples made and they worked pretty well, you know, and then had a lot of pro went through a lot of prototyping and making mm. a lot of different models and kind of slowly refined the designs and the shapes. You bet. And, um, and the manufacturing construction I ended up going to China a lot to the factory we were using mm. at the time, trying to perfect the um, process of making the boards. And, and then, uh, yeah, and then we started selling them pretty well, you know, and then um, the planet boards became pretty popular and, because we were kind of doing the direct from the factory to the consumer, we kind of cut out having to pay, you know, another company and, and so on. And I was doing the designs myself, so I didn't have to pay a shaper. So, nice. um, so our margins went up. Uh, we were able to make a little bit more money and mm. actually have a little bit of profit left over afterwards. And That's awesome. Um, and so and I had a um, really good financial advisor, mm. Mike Hulser, that helped me, you know, with the financials and trying to figure out you know, how can we make this business work, actually work where it makes yep. money, you know? So, um, yeah, so that was the whole process and that was, yeah, and been doing that for like, yeah, you know, it's almost 15, 20 years doing our own boards and that's, uh, that kind of, I think it's kind of saved the business that I was able to pull that one off. Incredible. Yeah. Um, two questions. Nowadays in 2024, 2023, the brand is really known for the tough tech model. We see the tough tech model around a lot. Uh, it's, it's really top, top seller. But when you first made the brand and things started going well, was there a specific board that kind of changed everything? Um, well, we had a lot of models. I mean, like, you know, and Kevin Fung was a manager at the time. He started just as a salesperson in the shop. And he, he, he was had just like a lot of ambition. Mm. And so I, I offered him like kind of some equity in the business to be kind of my right-hand man. And, and he took it on himself to do a lot of um, improvements to the line and, and create like a new lineup every, every year, you know, every season and uh, create the new products and have like a catalog and all that kind of stuff. So it nice. became kind of a more, prof a lot more professional thanks to Kevin. Mm. And, um, and he would come to the factory with me and then actually go to the factory by himself a bunch of times just to make sure the process, all the processes were running smoothly. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's a few models that are where the our best sellers that we and we still have the nine four fun stick. Yeah. It's nine four by thirty three. It's kind of thinner than most boards. Mm. Um, still stable. It surfs really well, and that's been one of our best sellers. And people mm. always love that board. Um, but. There's nothing really that like not one model that really stands out. I yeah. mean, our 14 foot bump rider mm. has never been a huge seller, but it's I think one of the best boards for for downwind racing yeah. and for the rough water racing. That's what I I mean. Still the the, mm. the uh, that's what I won the Molokai race on. Right. So the 14 foot bump rider um, has been the kind of a deve uh, in development, but it's kind of a lot different than a lot of the 14 footers that you can buy buy on the market. It's mm. More you know planing hull mm. it's not it's not like a super fast displacement board that you use in flat water but it's kind of designed for hawaii you know mm. so um but and then also like this the bigger one the bigger boards like it's a lot of um riders in hawaii that you know they're like older surfers that can no longer stand up you know they can't get from a prone position to standing position quick enough to prone surf anymore mm. they get into standard paddling and then they love it but they, you know, they need something pretty stable that still surfs well, you know, yep. like a little bit more volume and a little bit bigger size. And that's kind of where we specialize in a lot of, we have a lot of models, you know, the turbo, the, 
the um, 10 to easy, mm -hmm. the multitasker, the boss. Yeah. And we, so we had like a whole range of sizes that, that surfed well, but um, still, uh, you know, easy to use and, and good performance, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So that's kind of what we specialize in. And also we did the stand-up clinic. So we let people try out our models and we got a lot of people into the sport. Like I think we probably got more people into stand-up paddling than anybody in mm -hmm. Hawaii, you know? So that was, um, uh, yeah, unfortunately that ended during the pandemic. So yeah. that's like a whole different new chapter of the business, I guess. Yeah. Mm. You've had a lot of growth and expansion and fun in the paddleboard industry. When reading your book, I saw that you got to travel the world a lot, go to some really special places to enjoy water sports. Which one of those really stands out that you would like to share? Um, oh, I would say probably the boat trip to Mentawai stands mm -hmm. out. Um, just because not just the experience. I mean, the experience was awesome, but it's, it was also a huge um, logistical challenge, you mm -hmm. know, because we decided to do like our new line of boards and take everything to the Mentawai's. And that was the time when we first started having foil boards as well. So we had like foil boards, stand up surfing boards. We had like a team riders and then shipping everything to the mental wise was super expensive and wow. complicated. And then flying there with like three different legs of flights and then getting on the boat. And, and it was just a huge logistical challenge. And then, you know, the surf was okay, but not great, you know? So, and after that, I was like, oh, you know, let's just do it in Hawaii from now on because we can find good ways and just wait for the good conditions and yeah. not have to deal with all this uh, crazy stuff and spend a ton of money. But, mm. but it was cool, you know, because you, yeah, you're on a boat surfing all day, get fed, and then at night you go to bed and, the, and then the captain motors at night and you get to the new spot in the morning, you hear the anchor chain rattling down right before sun, sunrise, you know. And then you get up, have you know, go surfing before breakfast, and and get first light or whatever, get the first waves of the day, and some beautiful location with palm trees and in the middle of uh, you know, and just very remote places. Um, that was super cool. Yeah, that was a very yeah. memorable trip. Sounds like a dream. I I've, I've watched yeah. the video from that. Um, speaking of videos, you have a really awesome YouTube channel that you've been working very hard at for a long time. You're just about to reach 50,000 followers. How does it feel? How much has that changed Blue Planet? Yeah, I mean, you. so Tyler, I, I should say too, like when, when we had our shop on Ward Avenue, um, I don't even know if we had an ad in the, um, ask, like looking for um, people to work, but Tyler showed up with the tie <laughs> And uh, I've never seen a surf shop employee come come wearing a tie, you know, with yeah. a tie. That was, uh, was kind of funny, but but he was just uh, you were just super motivated, right? And um, and I think I told you like, oh, we don't have a job right now or something like that. But you, had you know, just maybe hired check somebody. check you know check back. Yeah, yeah. I think whoever we hired didn't really work out. So, yeah. but Tyler kept coming back, like, oh, you got a job now, I got a job now, or whatever. And then, um, yeah. So eventually hired you <laughs> yeah and then um yeah and then i mean later on like i guess jump in the head with the whole north shore store but then yeah yeah but anyway um yeah so where were we what was we're it? on youtube youtube yeah. and like, how much has youtube kind of changed blue planet yeah I so mean, yeah so you've been in the shop always and you know that when people come into the shop a lot of times they mention the youtube yes. channel right they're like oh you know you know, I, I came here because I saw all the YouTube videos yes. or whatever, you know, or I saw it, saw it on YouTube or whatever. So it became, you know, something I like to do. And a lot of this stuff was just instructional and like getting people into the sport and mm. sharing my knowledge. But it also became a marketing tool, you know. Yeah. And I actually got like when I kind of first started getting some traction, I got a call from or I got like an email from YouTube and saying, hey, we have these consultants they can you know do you want to schedule a call with one of the people and then um so i did and i talked to this lady um from youtube and you know she was like basically giving me pointers how to use the algorithm to grow the channel you know mm. so i you know i took notes and it was like i you know i actually did a talk about that too but um so in the early days she gave me some really good pointers you know the the title the description you know, and then using the um, analytics and certain things and responding to all the comments and all that kind of stuff. So I implemented all these things. And also one of the things was 
have a regular schedule, like always post consistently, because then that helps with the algorithm and people come back and and you grow and following, you know. So I did. Mm-hmm. So I decided, okay, I can't do it every day. I can't do it twice a week, but I can commit to doing it once a week, you know. So yeah. I said every every week I'm going to post, and then I looked at the um, at the analytics and like on the weekends where it's when we get the most views. So I said, okay, every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. we're going to post a new video. Mm. So that was like. I don't know, like 12, 13 years ago or something like that. And we've consistently posted a video every Saturday morning at 7, you know. Nice. I think we might, might have missed it once or twice, but um, yeah. very consistent. So that having that consistency helped with growing the channel. And then, yeah, just kind of looking at what people like mm. and what people are watching and then making more of it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of people have learned a ton of stuff from your YouTube channel you're 30 plus years into the business. There's so many different water sports that you've pursued. What's kind of getting you up in the morning today? You just finished your book. You know, foiling is expanding and also slowing down. What What's getting you up in the morning? Uh, <laughs> coffee. No. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I yeah, I mean... For me, yeah, just being able to do what I love, like having having this business that allow you know, and having customers that allow me to do what mm-hmm. I love is pretty special. Um, and I I still love foiling. I go wing foiling all the time. You know, when it's windy, I'm yeah. excited about going winging. Um, and then stand up paddling, um, like when it's when it's calm and smooth, I love to stand up paddle surf. Um, I also like hiking. Like sometimes just. I try to go on a hike where there's no one else around and just mm. kind of being being in nature by myself with my thoughts. I love that too. And yeah. And then, you know, I have my morning routine. I kind of start the morning pretty slowly. I take a couple hours really to um, do my some breathing, mm. Wim Hof breathing and exercises, stretching and yes. all that kind of stuff and journaling. You mentioned that in your book. Uh, yeah. Mm. So, and so I have my kind of like little morning routine and that, that uh, definitely gets me in the right mindset do a couple of things that are hard like the breathing exercises or then the you know doing 60 push-ups um it's not easy to but if i can get myself to do that first thing in the morning then everything else is kind of pretty easy after that you know yeah. <laughs> it's like the, everything doesn't seem as difficult and hard mm. and it's the same thing with the book too i really had to kind of force myself to do this write this book but it made it makes everything else i have to do kind of seem like tri- almost trivial and it's like yeah oh, this is easy in comparison to getting sitting down and writing a book you know but mm. yeah there's multiple expansions to blue planet now um it's no longer just a retail business but it's also a, we have you've got a new rental business too, blue planet adventure and you're also starting to dabble in a little bit of um you know real estate no uh, not commercial real estate is what I'm trying to say. You're dabbling a little bit in that. So how much focus do you have for each category? You know, the retail versus the rentals and the rentals versus the commercial real estate. Where's kind of your mindset starting to go? Um, no, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I've been in, in this organization called EO, Entre- Entrepreneurs Organization. That's kind of taught me like, um, you know, m- more about how to be a, a business owner mm. rather than just being a bit you know being an employee in your own business kind of thing yeah so I, I always try to think more of as an as an owner as an investor in the company so trying to have a business that kind of runs on kind of autopilot having good people that r- can run it for me delegate and then uh, you know working on the business not in the business mm. and then that allows me to do take on new things and and kind of um, yeah, but it's always a challenge to kind of make time for different things, and mm. sometimes I lose focus on one thing. And yep. but um, but real estate has been good good for me. Like I've you know I've, I mean started just with my own house that I lived in for a while, and then kept it as a rental, and then sold it like ten years later, and then invested with partners and other projects, and um, and that's I think I've made as much min- money in real estate as with Blue Planet <laughs> over the years, you know. But yeah, but it's been um, so it's been. That's something you say, I, I, that's something I'm probably going to keep doing even if I retire because it's like a very, you know, I can probably do it uh, in a few hours a month, the, mm. the work, you know, required versus, you know, for Blue Planet, I'm working every day, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, 
but let's talk a little bit about the North Shore, like that, that new rental location. So Blue Planet that, Adventure. That's kind of, that starts actually back in those days when I was selling at the swap meet, you know, mm. um, had clothing at the swap meet. Um, one of my neighbor stalls um, that was always next to us was, um, they were selling sarongs from Bali, mm. uh, Bill Martin from Island X, um, and just importing clo- clo- stuff from Bali. And uh, Tropical Rush was a shop on the North Shore, Glenn and Cecilia from Tropical Rush. They came to a swap meet and bought like tons of sarongs to put in their shop in Haliva. Yeah. And then they saw our stuff and was like, oh, can we, can I buy some of your shorts? You know, I was like, yeah, you know, and then, so yeah, I'll give you a wholesale price or whatever. And then um, they would just come to the swap meet and like take a half of our stuff that we had on the rack, you know, wow. it's like, here we want half, all these, <laughs> all these, all these, and, you know, make a big pile. I was like, well, it's, you know, doing pretty well, you know. Yeah. I mean, the first time they tried a few and then they sold. And so they started buying like piles of stuff, you know. Wow. And then I would just take my swap meet van after the swap meet, we drive up to Haliva. Mm. And it was just like rifle through all the boxes and, and buy stuff from us. And, and um yeah that was like in the 90s 1990s and um they were mm. doing pretty well they didn't have the access to the river yet they were just kind of in where Volcom is now you know oh. um but uh even back then i was like oh this is such a nice spot and then when you got the um river access i was like oh man this is perfect you know yeah and so and i always told them like hey if you ever want to retire let me know because you know, I, I, you know, we had a shop in town, but I was like, ah, maybe we should open a second location mm. in, in the North Shore or something yeah. like that. So, I, um, and, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, he, he, but he kind of remembered that, you know, he, he remembered I said that and he would remind me too. He's like, you remember you said that you want to buy the shop if I want to retire? He's like, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, they kept buying stuff from us, you know, first the clothing, then the um, stand-up paddle boards. And, yeah. and then during the pandemic, they had, um, you know, they had like, personal issues, financial issues, you know, but, um, he contacted me. He's like, Hey, I want to, I want to sell the business, you know? And it was a total mess. Like, um, Mm. you know, they didn't have a computer system. Like he like threw out all the computers because he thought they were somebody's, um, stealing from him or something like Mm. that. And it was, and, and the shop was closed. All the employees had taken off. And so I was basically taking over like, a. um, a failed business but i loved the location and he had just signed a new 10-year lease so i was basically buying the lease and then um you know it was an um and i wasn't sure like you know i, I can't like at the time too the you know blue planet was doing really well during the pandemic That's and, right, yeah and i was super busy and i was like i don't really have time to do this you know i was like you know i can't overextend myself you mm-hmm. know like this yeah. So even though I loved the location, I wanted, really wanted to do it. I didn't know how, how I could pull it off. And then, but then you heard about it. And at the time, you had moved on and doing your own um, sub dog business, right? Yeah. So, but it, I think as soon as you heard it from one of my staff members, you texted me. He's like, Rob, I, I, I want to run this shop for you. <laughs> I'm interested in Tropical Rush, yeah. period. Yeah. <laughs> And then I was Everyone. like, oh, you know, maybe maybe it could work if I have, you know, if Tyler can run it, then mm. maybe I could pull it off, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So then we, you know, it was like a pretty uh, tough negotiation but thing. And they wanted to close in like 30 days. So I had to mm. get all the paperwork figured out. And, and yeah. it was kind of uh, a little bit crazy. And then, yeah. And then like, you know, right now the everything looks, you know, nice. But it's when really we took nice. it over, it was like it. Like the deck was falling apart on yeah. the river. It was like, it was just kind of, a, everything was kind of a mess. So we had to kind of basically uh, renovate everything, mm-hmm. fix everything up. And, but, you know, it ended up being a really good project. And yeah. then we ended up like separating the ice cream store. Now we have Sweet mm-hmm. as Ice Cream. Then we got Makua Banana Bread. We leased the main shop to Volcom. You know, mm-hmm. we tried yeah. to run the shop ourselves for a long time. And then, yeah. Um, Volcom, I approached Volcom, they were interested in kind of buying us out. So, um, we worked out a deal with Volcom that works for them, mm. like paying us a percentage of revenues instead of giving us cash up front. Yeah. Um, and then my stepson Andrew has his uh, Haliva tattoo studio up there. Yeah. And then we have our own boardroom mm-hmm. where we sell our boards, and then the river um, operation, which Blue Planet Adventure. Uh, we started a separate business kind of for part of it is co- for liability reasons, insurance and right. so on, you know. So we have a separate business that is stand-up paddle and kayak rentals. 
And that's really kind of the main reason I love that location so much because it has yeah. like the boards on the water. You can put people on the calm river, even perfect for beginners. Anybody can paddle there. It's beautiful, um, you know, in the Rainbow Bridge. It's turtles in the water. Mm. You can paddle up the river. It can, you know, it's perfect for someone that just wants to paddle for an hour and yeah. have, um, you know, an, in easy conditions, have a little adventure there up on the North Shore. And whether you're a beginner or, or you just want to take friends or you're, you know, anybody can enjoy it. You know, you don't have to... Um, be a great paddler but any you know uh, an expert paddler will enjoy it too you know so it's, it's just a beautiful spot and um and so that that business has been working really well it's consistent you know we have um just rental income you know you don't have to there's no cost of goods sold you just get the rental fee and then they bring it back and you can rent it out again right yep. so it's a it's a good business model nice and then and then you know we subleasing a lot of spaces so yeah, that that whole thing worked out great, and then you uh, helped Volcom has start their new locate like their shop as a manager, and then, yeah, and now you're back in charge of Blue Planet again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you've yeah. done a great job with that property. You know, at that time when you first took over, I had worked for you for about three years. I had seen what you did with this shop because I remember seeing it before. You kind of renovated the interior. You did some negotiation with the landlord about some some rent trade off of the rent if you do some improvements. That to me was very impressive. So I thought, hey, he could definitely do it with this location if he's if this is something he wants to do. So just wanted to thank you for jumping on this show, for continuing to tackle all of these awesome construction projects, making all these boards, posting all these videos, you know, hiring all these amazing staff bringing in a really cool videographer and, Thanks, you know, Cam. just being inspiring <laughs> to us all, you know, you're part of the reason why I've started some other stuff, you know, and it's just inspiring to watch you. I remember when we were first, there was, the, what was it? The hub? Is there a hub right here in Honolulu where they have all the business meetings in the hub? I think it's called the hub. Um, anyway, I saw you do, uh, you stood up at a business meeting at the hub. And you were just talking about Blue Planet. I had just started working for you. I remember I'm sitting with a few other staff and I'm just like full on smiles and clapping like this dude's incredible, right? So we just wanted to thank you. Jumping on your own show, the Blue Planet show. It's been an honor having Robert Stelic, the owner of Blue Planet, on the Blue Planet show. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tyler. This is Cam. We'll see you guys out on the water. All right. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Aloha.